Hello and most will come to Wittgenstein or Heidegger 17, 32. And we would today continue with the article by Daniel Hupto. Wittgenstein and psychology. So, I'm back. Sorry for the mess up, we continue. Last time we went into how everything in the world interconnects to make a whole of meaning, use, understanding. It's about possibilities inherent in our form of life. So everything counts, nothing stands outside of this. We are communally participating with every aspect of the universe. This is the global understanding of reality and it's also the understanding of modern day quantum physics as propounded by physicists Alan Specht, Klausinger and Seilinger, who got the Nobel Prize last year. They show that there is no such thing as local reality. All is this tangled reality. So we continue where we left off, which is the fourth paragraph on page eight. Although this aids in getting clearer by various subject matters, there are no general rules for the use of psychological concepts that can be articulated. Thus, Wittgenstein's descriptions always take the form 
of case by case examples. What he seeks to describe is not a comprehensive set of rules. For the use of concepts, but remind us of how we might possibly use our concept. Again, the point of providing these reminders is not to provide new factual information or to provide better theory of some objective phenomenon that can be studied independently of understanding the possibilities inherent in our form of life. For these reasons in conducing his philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein is neither doing natural science nor yet natural history. But equally, since he's not trying to divine an a priori set of general rules for the use of concepts, He isn't doing traditional metaphysics. Indeed, by his lights, the essential thing about metaphysics is that it problemat problematically obliterates the distinction between factual concepts and conceptual investigations. Namely, a metaphysical attempt to divine the essence of things in an attempt to discover a set of explanatory superfacts that fix all other facts. Let, getting clear about these aspects of uh, his project is vital if we are to understand how he understands the ultimate target of his grammatical investigations to be conceptual. Certainly, he is not pursuing a program of ordinary language philosophy. Rather, he rejects the possibility that we might have privileged access to a neutral, independent, metaphysical reality in favor of the acknowledgement that we can do no better 
than to note how we use our psychological concepts. and explore different possible uses of those concepts through imaginary exercise. It is with this in mind that he tells us we are not analyzing a phenomenon that is thought, but a concept, that of thinking. Therefore, the use of the word. Such comparisons can help to break the temptation to try to observe hidden or underlying processes that go on when we are thinking. by exploring how we might use our concept of thinking, we get beyond the misleading idea that we will somehow divine the essence of thinking by discovering new facts about the special mental process that the word thinking names. In getting us to give up the idea that there is yet there is some yet to be discovered state or process that the term thinking denotes wittgenstein is also redirecting us toward what should be of interest to us when we wish to investigate the nature of our psychology. We forget that what should interest us is the question how do we compare these experiences? What criterion of identity do we fix for their occurrence? Thus he bids us to look on the language game as the primary thing. For all these reasons, Wittgenstein contrasts exploring our language games descriptively with the advancing of explanations and conjectures
he regards our theoretical commitments and explanatory ambitions as corrupting and dangerous. They can mesmerize us and drive us to systematically misrepresent our practices. Hence, it often happens that we only become aware of the important facts if we suppress the question why. Knowing how we go round and in seeking general explanations of psychological phenomena, he warns against a main cause of philosophical disease, a one-sided diet. One nourishes one's thinking with only one kind of example. Deep-seated philosophical errors begin to take root in the fertile soil of questing after philosophical explanations that we feel compelled to supply, but focusing too much on just one aspect of a phenomenon can lead us to elevated to the status of the essential feature. Thus, when other equally prominent features are noticed, they threaten to occupy this position, serving as counterexamples, or at the very least, they require some other accommodation. Through philosophical theorizing, one is led to intractable questions, contradictions that in turn spur on the production of further attempts at revised theory and improved explanation. One is thus quickly drawn into an elaborate web of theorizing, often without any clear means of evaluating the various proposals in play. But this process only obscures and takes us away from what we wanted to understand in the first place. And takes us further 
and further away from genuine resolutions. Attention to what is possible for us to say and do is the only way to break free of the spell cast by a misleading picture and the theoretical commitments and misguided explanatory agenda it inspires. To get entirely free of misleading pictures, picture requires not just removing the source of our puzzlement, but be reminded by means of example, examples of the conditions for the possible use of concepts. There I put a point to the B edition. 1732 B page 10 concepts. Let me take you back to page nine. Third paragraph is especially telling and recommendable to almost memorize by heart. And is this fascination, the third paragraph beginning with such on page nine. Such comparisons can help to break the temptation to try to observe hidden or underlying processes that go on when we are thinking. By exploring how we might use our concept of thinking we get beyond the misleading idea that we will somehow divine the essence of thinking by discovering new facts about the special mental process that the word thinking names. It's so aptly put paragraph 316 and this covers most of the current misunderstandings when it is the search for the eternal first cause the big bang it's hidden you will never know about it the first original Instead of the original we have in front of us that is connected and instead we search for something unconnected and call that original. And we look for the source of thinking that look, that search, that intention is in itself misleading we already have thinking it's out there or in there if you prefer it is nothing remarkable but at the same time 
absolutely miraculous and enticing. Two paragraphs down. For all these reasons, Wittgenstein contrasts exploring our language games descriptively with the advancing of explanation and conjectures. Of course, our myopia, our inability to see what is exactly in front of us, we look for it elsewhere. In places that do not exist. He regards our theoretical commitments and explanatory ambitions as corrupting and dangerous. They can mesmerize us and drive us systematically, drive us to systematically misrepresent our practices. Hence, it will often happen that we only become aware of important facts if we suppress the question why. And this is also a very good quote from Philosophical Investigations. Four, seven, one. You memorized as well. We look for a first course. And be careful here now. Easy to confuse this Y with the Heideggerian Y. I would say it's just the opposite. Being is the thing that is in front of us. We are asking for something beyond, and that is beings. What, where, how, when, and so forth. Instead of being that we already are in, but our eyes are, <laughs> so to speak, not so good vision, our long sightedness, our far sightedness, just in our everyday world, in our use. That's the place where meaning takes place. Things start to become useful and workable. And we develop, and here we find the original. Here, yeah, I think to make a comparison to Timothy B's book, that used to be the case that religion was what we did inside it, what we participated in. But it has become an explanatory, false explanation. So the doings are disappearing and we are making our minds, if you like, passive or only receivers of something. And we see something as passive. Book of the Bible as passive and us as passive. But there can be life in every sentence. It has a value. It had this, we mentioned at an earlier time, the musicality of language, the words well picked, not sign or psych signified or intention. The exact phrasing, the original phrasing, that has a value in itself.
because it participates in the present. And the last is from the author Hutto himself. I wonder where that name is coming from. Deep-seated philosophical errors, that's the last paragraph, begin to take root in the fertile soil of question, questing after philosophical explanations that we feel compelled to supply or focusing too much on just one aspect of a phenomenon can lead us to elevate it to the status of the essential feature, the essence, the archaic, the atom. And what happens is explained next. Thus, when other equally prominent features are noticed, they threaten to occupy this position, serving as counterexamples, or at the very least, they require some accommodation. So we will then get into an endless confusion. It would be sheer pain to live out such a life, and you can never ever get to the answer getting further and further into the cave and you try to figure out how you inside the cave can open the door that's locked on the outside i think that's pretty much what it's about you're inside the cave but the door the entrance is actually on the outside and there inside the key lock is also the key. And that's the everyday life. What we do with the words bring their meanings. Where else would meaning come from? From Alpha Centauri? From the Big Bang? And that we can never understand meaning? I think these tendencies as drawn to the very furthest limits can make us almost eerie. I remember one science festival where my professors in philosophy participated and somebody asked about the meaning in life. And one professor said, well, that question could be answered maybe in a hundred years. Have we got machines sufficiently advanced? I think now that the question was wrong from the beginning, but the answer indeed did not make anything better. That's the idea of a hiddenness. And Horvich in the beginning, we can look at that closer next time, call that scientism. A sort of empty trust that this will one day be understood and it could almost be understood already as i speak well Kalle. yes let me questions on page nine this is quotation from philosophical investigations paragraph 38 3 we are not analyzing a phenomenon that is thought, for instance, but a concept that is of thinking. Therefore, we use of the word. No, oh, yeah. Uh, so, we could perhaps compare phenomenon to a noun, thought. So, it's a passive thing. Thought as a noun is something passive, um, stasis. But concepts, 
thinking is around, but it works here also as a participle. Uh, so the concept is uh, okay, it's a noun, but it's also participle. If you compare thinking to a thought, thought is something passive, but thinking is something um, active, or should be interactive, at least. Uh, so, <clears throat> and we could compare with Heidegger's uh, Denken is Duncan. Uh, oh, yeah. So, uh, yes. so uh, although Heidegger, unlike Wittgenstein, looks for the ocean because he's interested in the hidden, uh, it's a different kind of. Um, Heidegger has no strategy for the past. So he thinks that you have dancer in the past, see the etymology of the birds. But still, he is not fixated in the past. He, um, he sees that things are processes. The Ingen is Duncan, so it's an active process, it's not a focus on a phenomenon, a thought. Yeah. And you can also see when you give an explanation to something, mm. of course there, there is space for explanation, but if you overuse it in the wrong area, context, mm. the explanation makes something static, not participating. Mm. Mm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, perhaps we should leave it there. Yes, we okay. can just say what is often <clears throat> gives something of an esteem, something static or stale or fixed. Mm. Whereas that question, take away the white question in the Wittgensteinian sense, and to go to the things themselves, and you will find meaning once more. And meaning is in use, in everyday use, that takes in all aspects of reality. And there I end. Say thank you very much, Kalle Lundahl. And thank, thank you. you for listening in, watching, hearing. Have a good day, afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Bye-bye for now. Ja, jag tänker att det är klockan 20. Jag misstänker att det blir svårt ikväll, men vi kan höras i alla fall. Visst. Tack så mycket, Kalle, för idag. Det var väldigt bra. Hej då, hej då.